Good evening. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center, and I'm also the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our cancer education series this evening. And uh, we have a guest, Andrea Gleason's with us. Andrea is a, a cancer survivor, and we're going to talk about um, living life to the fullest. And we're going to talk a bit about uh, Andrea's cancer journey, but even more importantly, what uh, she's learned and sort of life lessons that uh, that we all might take from uh, from her journey. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you. So you grew up here in central Iowa. Yes, right? I did. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Norwalk, mm -hmm. I think you told me. Yeah. And uh, so what was your claim to fame in high school? I was very active into academics and sports. So I was always trying to get straight A's and be the best that I could be in every sport that I did as and, well. And what was your best sport? I would think it's a tie between dance team and volleyball. Okay. So senior year, I got MVP of our volleyball team at five foot, six feet tall. All right. Were you the setter? Or? I was the outside hitter. Even. Outside hitter. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Good. And did you do any performing arts in high school? Uh, I did do acting as well. Okay. Yeah. So was there a role in high school that you're most proud of? Um, I just did a bunch of small roles. I didn't really have a, a standing out role per se. Okay. Because Norwalk is noted for creating like world famous actors. Yes. Seriously. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so name a couple. Uh, Brandon Routh, his mom was my second grade teacher. And Brandon played? Superman. Yeah. yeah. Superman in the yeah. movies from yeah. Norwalk. Right. And so that made me think that I could uh -huh. do that too. And and then the other famous Norwalk uh, actor? Jason Momoa. Uh -huh. Another huge one that just yeah, inspired me to be the best that I could be and try to be like them. So, so I asked Andrea about the performing arts in Norwalk because I know a little bit of her story. So we're mm -hmm. actually meeting in person for the first time. Yes. But I know a bit of her story. So uh, when you graduate from um, high school, you didn't say, I'm going to be a D1 volleyball player. That no. wasn't that wasn't really where you not quite going, not at five. Right. Five. Not quite there. Okay. I did a Simpson dance team. So I actually did the dance team route right. just because I wasn't tall enough for uh -huh. college volleyball. And so when you started college at Simpson, what was your first declared major? It was communications, I'm pretty sure. I thought a lot about being a writer. Mm -hmm. My English professor encouraged me to be a food critic because I was already a waitress in high school as well. And that was something I always enjoyed doing on the side as well. Okay. And then your uh, your education path took you from Simpson to Colorado, I think. Yes. Right? I ended up graduating from Metropolitan State University in Denver with the communications degree and then a minor focus in theater. Okay. And did you do any um, live theater in college in, in Denver? I did not. I don't know. I really should have spent more time <laughs> being involved in theater. Because once you graduate from college, then then where do you go? Then I decided to move to California to be an actress. <laughs> okay. And not just California. Right. Hollywood. Hollywood. Yes. Right in Living the heart of it. In Hollywood. Yes. To be an actress. Yes. And um, so we, we talked a bit about being adventuresome and, you know, uh, I've done adventure sports and you've done some adventure, but going to an audition. Audition to be an actor, that seems a whole lot scarier to me than jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. Yeah, it's very intimidating. And some days you'd be going to five different ones in really? one day. Yeah. So what was the first audition that you remember that you, you went for? I think it was a car commercial. And, you know, you memorize the lines and you go there and you try to do the best that you can. So, so uh, if I just moved to California, can I go to an audition for a commercial or do I need to get a actor's agent? Light? You have to get an agent. You have to get first. an agent. And and do you have to belong to the actor's guild to, to audition? Yes, you have to get enough small parts to work your way into the SAG-AFTRA community that then you can get an agent that will, can send you on. Okay, but, but if I'm just going to go for a car commercial? You still have to have an agent. Okay. Yeah, it's very so, difficult. So you got it. So you, you tell me a bit about that first rehearsal. Were you scared? Oh, yes. I I would 
being a perfectionist, just practice my lines over and over and over until I had them perfectly. But then once you get in the room, your nerves hit and it's hard to deliver everything as perfect as you practiced at home. Okay. What was the biggest job you got as a professional actor? The biggest in my eyes would be like the most speaking lines, like uh -huh. the biggest amount of screen time. Uh -huh. And it was, I was living in California, but I asked, I got asked to come home to do auditions as well. I have a local agent here too. And it was a independent film that I did. It was called Sick of Larry. Okay. So that's my biggest claim to fame. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, we'll have to look for that. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, and I, and I don't mean to make light of this at all mm -hmm. because I, I just totally admire and respect somebody who will just go for it. Right. Uh, you probably were doing something else for income though. Yes. I definitely didn't make any money in my acting <laughs> career, which eventually led me to do something else. So I actually was a waitress and I waited on all of the celebrities that mm -hmm. I admired to be. And that's what paid off the bills. What was your, uh, uh, what, what waitressing job was, was the most satisfying uh, or the most fun or that you had the most connection with yes, so beautiful I, people in California? Oh yes. It, which is also intimidating because you don't, you want to make sure that everything goes perfectly for them. I worked at LA live downtown Los Angeles and that's where the Staples Center was. So I would wait on all of the celebrities before they went to concerts or the NBA basketball players. Uh, the biggest celebrities I waited on was Tom Hanks and Taylor Swift and the Kardashians. That one scared me the most. <laughs> that was very intimidating. What do Kardashians eat? Um, most of them just eat salads and okay. lots of martinis. Okay, yes. salad and martini. Mm -hmm. So eventually you decide reluctantly that it's just the acting career is not going to not gonna happen. Just wasn't going to work out. And you for came me. back. So when you decided to come back, did you, was that difficult emotionally, psychologically to, to admit to yourself uh, that? that it, you just weren't able to make it? Yes, it was like a failure, I guess, in the way that I looked at it, but it's okay to fail. Like I was told no so many times, I just decided that it wasn't for me. And however difficult that may be or was for me, I knew that there was always going to be something next, another dream that I mm -hmm. could pursue. What do you think, uh, what are some lessons learned from your California experience? It was very challenging to be confident and secure in who you are, especially in the industry when they're telling you you're not good enough or you don't look the right way and then waiting on intimidating people. So it really made me uh, thicker skin and more confident and stronger and who I was and what I wanted and that I was okay to accept failure in one aspect to go strive for another dream, then that was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you did pursue that and learned what it was really like. Yeah. It's not just a... It wasn't what you see on TV and it wasn't an enjoyable mm -hmm. life for me okay. personally. So you come back to Iowa. Yes. And um, we, I know we're going to get into cancer having an effect. Where did the cancer fit into your life? What were you doing at the time that you uh, detected um, the lymph nodes that were enlarged that led to your cancer diagnosis? So after California, um, my boyfriend and I, we were, we road tripped all the way home, you know, going to all the parks and he proposed at Yosemite Falls. And so it was, it made coming home a lot better. Like we had a new future together and something to look forward to. We decided to, we really wanted to open a restaurant together, but it just wasn't feasible at the time financially and investors didn't believe in us. They, we just didn't have enough to go off of. So Des Moines approved food, food trucks. So we, my boyfriend or now fiance and I decided to open a food truck. So we were one year into working away on the food truck and I had uh, like an egg in my armpit and we had already booked our wedding for a following year. And that's when I found a doctor at Mercy Clinic who did the testing and the results came back 
melanoma. Melanoma. So back before you found out it was melanoma, you knew it was there for a while and you had seen some healthcare professionals who said, oh, don't worry about it or... Yes, a perfect 29 year old, you know, starting her own business, uh, seem seemingly perfectly healthy, was put on antibiotics for 10 days. And then I went and got another opinion, just put on antibiotics for another 10 days because, you know, there's no way that it could have been cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I finally went to a third doctor and she truly listened to my concern of this isn't going away and maybe we should look further into what is going on in this area. And had you started the, the truck, uh, the food truck? So had we that... were one year into the food truck. Uh -huh. and and was it, what was the name of your food truck? A gastro grub food truck. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so then you get a biopsy. Mm -hmm. How were you told that the biopsy was positive for cancer? They scheduled the ultrasound with the biopsy. So mm -hmm. I'm looking on the screen and I could see the big black circle on the screen. And even in the doctor doing the biopsy, I could tell, you know, it wasn't his job to tell me, but he was nervous. And he said, you don't have a mammogram scheduled today, but I'm sending you straight to mammogram. And that was my first red flag of this isn't just a swollen lymph node with, you know, an infection. And it was one week later, she told me I needed to come into the office. And that's when she sat me down and she and told she me. she is a doctor, your, your doctor, your yes. primary care doctor. Yes, her name is Dr. Nedalyn Sandvig. Yes, she's very, very good. She's amazing. So she said, you need to come in. We're going to have a comment. Yes. So when, when the doctor told you on the phone, you need to come in to have this conversation. That's another flag of this isn't just something that can be told over the phone. Mm -hmm. And that's like, but it's still going through your mind. There's no way it's cancer. And, you know, maybe something else that is serious, but it couldn't be, I, I couldn't be that, but it was a possibility. And so then when you're sitting uh, in her office and she tells you that it is a cancer called melanoma, what was your thoughts? My first thought is, well, what is that? And it's the deadliest form of skin cancer, but it wasn't on my skin. And so I just had a hard time understanding what exactly was going on. Mm hmm because it had uh, shown up in your lymph nodes. And, and as you've shared, they never did find the primary skin cancer, but it had uh, spread from it, the skin into your lymph nodes. And then I'm sure you uh, got scheduled to see some cancer doctors. Then. Yes. I went to Dr. Brian Freeman, downtown Mercy Oncology next, and he was great at explaining you know, the scan and everything to me. And you had a PET scan. Yes. 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 And so uh, they obviously did not uh, find any cancer in the breast initially before they did the biopsy and found it was melanoma, not breast cancer. It's uh, logical to think, well, lymph nodes in the arm, if it is cancer, probably came from the breast, but it didn't. Absolutely. Melanoma. And so the only place it was, was in the lymph nodes under the arm. And um, must under the muscle in the chest as well. Okay, over on that side. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, determined the extent of the cancer and then um, the plan for what the treatment would be. So uh, how, to, how, how was the conversation about, well, how are we going to treat this? Dr. Freeman said he had, you know, very few choices to work with here locally. Chemotherapy is actually something that does not work very well for melanoma at all. And surgery can be complicated as well. He did want me to meet with a surgeon, but his, his idea was to send me to Iowa City, University of Iowa Hospital and Clinic, where we have a very talented specialist in melanoma and sarcoma. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Freeman sent an email to him with me in the room, and his name is Dr. Mo. And he was thrilled to take me on as one of his patients willing to do clinical trials. Yeah. And you were diagnosed, what year were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed in 2016 and I was 29 years old. 2016. And so by then, this whole field of immunotherapy had just absolutely revolutionized the treatment of melanoma. 
Yes. Immunotherapy. Yes. And uh, doctor, we are blessed here in Iowa to have one of the world's experts on melanoma, Dr. Mohammed Millam, or Dr. Mo, mm -hmm. as uh, he goes by, uh, it took you on and, uh, and talked about uh, participation in clinical trials. Yes. I had no idea what that even meant before. You know, you learn a lot about what cancer is and what the different options are and what's going on in your body. And he was just one of the best at explaining exactly what each trial would do and what he expected out of it. And uh, before you had a treatment plan, uh, so you're told you have melanoma in your lymph nodes. Did you Google it? Oh, yes, <laughs> which they don't yeah. recommend. <laughs> uh, and, and what, before you found out what you were going to get for treatment, what did you think after you Googled melanoma and lymph nodes? You really just question your body and how did your own cells mutate into something that's actually trying to kill your body and hiding from your immune system. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense how this can occur in so many people and so many different types of cancers. And with melanoma, did you think about how could I possibly have gotten melanoma? Did you? For sure. I questioned why me and how did this happen? And then you look back into your history and it almost everything I did kind of evolved into this perfect storm is what I like to call it as to why I do think it was me that that got the melanoma. And what are some of the causes of melanoma that you so, learned? Uh, as a child, I was always outside swimming in the pool all the time, riding bikes, hiking, always outside. Wasn't always very good at wearing sunscreen. You know, you you think you'll just put aloe on it and you'll heal it and it'll go away. Well, if you develop too many sunburns, you're damaging those cells over and over. Then on top of that, as a dancer growing up, I was encouraged to do free tanning beds. So, you know, we all tried to be the tannest we could be and all try to match each other to look perfect on the dance floor and dance competitions. And so I had both of those things going against me and, you know, some of the poor choices that I made. Plus, there, I feel like there is a little bit of genetics in there. I have the red hair gene. My brother is redhead, so we're both very fair skin and freckles. So we're doing even more damage every time we got sunburn or went tanning. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle even had a, a piece of melanoma on his ear that needed to be removed. So I feel like that it was in yeah. the so genetics. Yeah, the family history. Yes. You've also got the... Uh, the fair skin mm -hmm. where your skin uh, doesn't tolerate the UV light as much. Uh, you're outside in the sun and, um, and you're in a tanning bed. So I, I don't say any of that to, to blame. I mean, we only know what we know. Right. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the young women that are going to the tanning beds and, mm -hmm. and um, don't realize the, the potential risk. I mean, it's one thing to damage your skin and sort of end up with uh, premature wrinkles and, and damaged skin by the time you're 60 or 70. You don't think about that much at age 16, right. but that, that you could develop a fairly serious cancer based on using a tanning bed. I remember seeing like the signs that were posted in the tanning beds, but that's all there is to warn you that this may cause cancer. But you just think, well, that's not going to happen to me. And all my best friends are doing it, and they're all fine as well. So back to uh, being offered a clinical trial. What did you think? Did you think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be a guinea pig here? Yes. I joked that I was a lab rat. Mm. And Dr. Mo and I talked about how important it is for people to actually sign up for these clinical trials to learn what could save lives. So you're doing it to be a lab rat or guinea pig, but you could be trying out the newest drug that could save lives. Yeah, and that be you're, the not cure. Only, you're not only taking medicine that is likely to be beneficial, but you're also going to advance the science. Yes. And um, so your uh, melanoma was discovered at a time where immunotherapy was already well known and, and uh, we're still doing studies like, is there 
combinations of immunotherapy? Is there something with the immunotherapy? Um, so do you want to describe for our audience, what, what is, how does immunotherapy kill cancer cells? So immunotherapy actually boosts your immune system to try to find the cancer cells to go and attack it. It's like w waking up your immune system to find the cancer cells that are normally hiding from your body. And that's where these trials would find different ways to unveil the cancer cells and then boost your immune system mm -hmm. to fight the cancer on its own without being harmful like chemotherapy yeah excellent so chemotherapy traditional chemotherapy is medicine that is you know it's not it's not an exaggeration to call it a poison it's poison to cells it just is a directly kills cells and um it directly kills cells that are that are uh, uh growing more than it kills dormant cells so that's why cancer cells are more sensitive but it kills a lot of cells whereas immunotherapy the immunotherapy medicine you get in your vein does not kill cancer cells it revs up your body's immune system and your immune system seeks and destroys so every day our immune system is killing cancer cells that, that before they ever get a chance to grow and become a, a cancer. Mm -hmm. So by by revving up your immune system, your own immune system uh, fought the cancer cells. Now, you, were you able to feel the lymph nodes yourself? Uh, the primary tumor, I uh -huh. could feel it. It was like uh -huh. the size of an egg. The primary lymph node. So the the good news about that is you can also feel when it starts to shrink. Right. You don't need a CAT scan right. if you can feel it. That's so, cheating. Yeah, so but it's exciting. At, at what point did you know that the immunotherapy was working? So I believe I did five rounds of Keytruda mixed with Indoximod. And each, it was like every three weeks or so, I could feel it shrinking and shrinking. The, the biggest issue that I had was my immune system overcharged. Mm -hmm. So I experienced vitiligo and it pretty much wiped me of all my melanin, like attacked the melanocytes. And so, you know, my hair turned white, my eyebrows turned white, my skin it pretty much took away all my freckles, my moles. Mo Dr. Mo said this was the best side effect. It's showing how amazing it's working, like how strong the immunotherapy was boosting. The only issue was then I reached toxicity and he had to remove me from treatment. Mm, because you're starting to have side effects that were causing symptoms. So it, it, it started to affect my liver. My enzymes were elevated to a toxic level mm -hmm. that I could no longer receive any more treatment. And so I had completed a five treatments and I had to be removed. What, what does that feel like? I was horrified. We were at a point where we didn't know how much immunotherapy does it take to heal you? And is it possible that you may only need a few treatments? Originally, they thought I might have to be on this indefinitely to keep my immune system fighting the cancer forever. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, when you were taken off at that time, was that the end of your treatment then? So then I was monitoring the lymph node and it continued to shrink. And again, we were, it was an experiment. We were waiting to see what was going to happen. So during this time, you know, Mo said, live your life as normal as you can. I'm like, okay, so I know cancer is in there and I'm not for sure what it's doing. And like everything was going great. I uh, was still working the food truck. Uh, we were planning our wedding. I was making him do dance classes for our first dance. You know, I just really focused on living my life. And it wasn't until the scan after our wedding, so it was about eight months of no treatment, um, Dr. Mo was the first one in the room, and he said, your scan has turned too much worse. He said, so that at that point, the immunotherapy stopped working. And so... It, I think we, I just went too long and it kind of reversed. So um, I don't want to put you through the memories, but mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that we're, we've come to a, a good conclusion now. But <laughs> when Mo come, Dr. Mo comes in and says, oh, things are a lot worse. What did, what did, 
what went through your mind and what did you say? What was the conversation you had? It was almost worse than being told you have cancer because you have so much hope that this new treatment is going to work. Like this is going to be perfect. You know, I'm so lucky that this exists or I w may not even be here. But then when he told me that it's very like my hope dropped for that moment and I cried. Who, who was in the room with you? My mom and Dr. Mao. And he spent the most time talking to me and we talked about everything in life and eventually followed by, you know, what the next steps are going to be. Mm -hmm. And then the next step was? Dr. Mo was hesitant to put me back on Keytruda as it really affected my body. I had to do steroids in order to get my body back to a healthy level, you know, before I could even think about doing anything. And he decided maybe not do Keytruda right away, but let's do a new trial if I was open to it and if I was willing to try. And it was a different immunotherapy drug? So, or? so this one, it was a man-made virus that they injected directly into the tumor called CMP001. And, uh, you know, we decided to keep injecting it and, and see what would happen next. And? And I, my body formed a cyst around the area and it kept growing and growing, probably almost to we're at softball size level. So my arm, I could not even put my arm down and it, it actually exploded externally. And oh. so that didn't work out very well for me either. Did you have to have surgery? So then I, I emailed and I called Dr. Mo and I said, this is what happened. And he said, you need to come up to Iowa City immediately and we have to do emergency surgery because we now have an open wound that could have cancer cells mm -hmm. in it. So then we, yeah, it was my birthday. I was turning 31 at this point and went into emergency surgery and they ended up taking out 25 lymph nodes. The immunotherapy had shrunk the tumor area down to where they felt like they could finally cut it all out where at the beginning it was unresectable, which they could not get at all. So he said like that was the first great step that was able to get me to the point of being able to do surgery. And then it was messy. They, they didn't know what was dead cancer or live cancer or mm -hmm. what was going on. And they wanted to study this. So I signed up for a research study of melanoma where they mailed it off and it's being studied down to the microscopic level so we can learn more mm -hmm. about immunotherapy. And then they decided it would be best to follow that with radiation to make sure that there wasn't any cancer left behind in that area. And so following the surgery, you had some radiation. Yes. And then he felt confident enough and put me back on Keytruda immunotherapy. They call it to like mop it all up to just mm -hmm. get your immune system going hopefully indefinitely that it'll be strong enough to keep attacking the cancer forever. And how long did you get the immunotherapy at that point? That one, I think we just did about three or five more doses. And then uh, I was still like every three months scans to make sure. And it was the next summer I found like a small little egg on my arm. And I'm like, this can't be like, I have to be cured, right? Went straight to Dr. Mo. They did find small cells of melanoma, and he's like, let's do nothing. Let's see if your immune system knows what it's doing now. And sure enough, it, it went away. Um, With, without more immunotherapy? Without more. Wow. Yeah. Fat, you know, I, I'm a cancer doctor, but your story is just <laughs> amazing. And so when was the last time that you had any immunotherapy, any cancer treatment? It was... February of 2018. 2018. Mm -hmm. And every scan has been clean since then. Yes. So this January will be another scan and it'll be four years clear. Wow. That is amazing in so many different ways. But the way that the immunotherapy has changed the face of how we treat cancer. Yeah. Wow. Because without it, surgery wasn't an option. So, uh, Take me back to going through the treatment and then the recurrence and then the, the wound and then the surgery radiation. How are you, I mean, you're 
31 years old. You're, you're just uh, been married for a year or so. You've got this business you're trying to do. You're going to Iowa City to get your treatments. Mm -hmm. How do you keep all the balls in the air? I'm not sure how I did it looking back, but the main focus is setting goals for yourself. I had goals in my medical life and in my business life. I'm not someone that's going to give up easily. I'm going to make sure that I leave it all out there. And so my small goals were making sure like, oh, this next scan, my, you know, I'll get good results and my labs will be good. And those were all the the medical goals. Then in the personal goals, it was, well, I just left, you know, my career in California and it was just my husband and I, and the food truck business, it was good, but it was too challenging. You know, you're on a tiny truck and the temperatures in Iowa are outrageous, whether they're too hot or too cold. Physically exhausting. Yes. And it was very hard on my body. I was like, it would be nice to have a facility that has a bathroom and, you know, drinking water and just something a little bit more comfortable. And so that's what pushed me into, you know what, I don't know how much time I have left here. So let's go from food truck to restaurant. Like, let's make it happen. Like I have nothing left to lose and I don't know how much time I have left to make my dreams come true. So you, you said that phrase a couple of times. I don't know how much time I have left. So clearly uh, this, this journey with cancer that you're on uh, made you think about mortality. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I never would have thought about that. I know there's a risk to skydiving or cliff jumping or the things I did before, but cancer is a different level of risk of whether you're going to survive or not, especially melanoma with it not chemotherapy not necessarily mm -hmm. working and so you just think about i may not be here i flip a coin mm -hmm. i have a 50 percent chance of beating this is what i thought mm -hmm. yeah and with the cancer there's this long period of uncertainty <laughs> I mean, you jump out of the airplane with a parachute on, you find out in about two minutes. I made it. <laughs> whether you made it or didn't make it. And if you made it, yeah. you know, it's not like lingering over you for months. But the, the cancer journey you were on, there's like lots of time. Almost two to years. To think about, is this going to work or not yeah. work? Am I going to be alive or not alive? So um, some people have said, you know, we, we all have two options. We could just go into our bed and pull the covers over our head and mm -hmm. just, you know, wait till we die yeah. or we can choose to grab every moment and make sure that no matter how many moments I have left, I'm going to fill them. Absolutely. And clearly. Do you want to live life to the fullest? Even if you only have two years left, I always think like, what can you do with those two years mm -hmm. to leave your little mark on earth? However, big or little it may be, which is why I decided to, journal my story publicly as I went through it and pushed myself to open a restaurant so that, you know, my husband could have something and so that everybody in central Iowa could have a place that they could come and enjoy time with their loved ones and enjoy life and have a good experience. So um, one would have to be incredibly not just strong, but also perceptive to try to get through all of this alone by just thinking about it and journaling. Besides the doctors that were helping to get rid of your cancer, did you have other professionals in the, the world of healthcare that were helping you with the emotional, psychological, philosophical aspect of going through uh, such a challenging, potentially life ending disease. I definitely needed help emotionally and mentally. Cancer is almost more of a mental challenge than a physical challenge. I could have pushed my body to do, you know, what I needed to do physically. It was the emotional part that was very challenging. And I knew I needed help. It's amazing to have support of friends and family and those people around you to get through every day but you almost need someone who understands cancer 
and I went to the psychiatrist and psychology at University of Iowa. Dr. Mel referred me to that program where I did uh, group therapy and worked with the doctors there to help improve my emotional health, my mental health, because that is almost hurting just as bad as your physical health. Mm -hmm. So is there a time during your cancer journey as you're trying to also develop a business and come up with ideas of transforming from a food truck to a restaurant that you just had to, that you, that you couldn't move forward? That Did you ever become sort of emotionally paralyzed to be able to move forward with your life? I was, I was struggling and I never stopped physically. I think I pushed myself farther than what I should have. Looking back, I would work 12 hour days and not get very much sleep. And just because I was so determined on the business goals and pushing myself, I think I exhausted my mental health. And I, you know, would go in the bathroom and start crying, but I wouldn't let anybody else see that because I would smile at work. I would go to radiation in Iowa City and drive back to the restaurant and stand at the front door to welcome every guest because it was our opening week. And I had severe burns on my body, but I just, I felt like I had to do it because this is the timing that it ended up being. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what did you learn from uh, the um, oncopsychiatrist that uh, specializes in caring for uh, cancer patients through either one-on-one -on -one or group sessions. What did, uh, what coping mechanisms or what did you learn about yourself through that mental health counseling that uh, helped you get through the cancer journey and maybe has helped you with how you're living your life now? They definitely focused on taking care of yourself. You need to make sure you're giving your body all the things you need and your mind, you know, eating right, sleeping enough, and, you know, stepping back a few hours from work if that's what you need to do to heal your body and finding joy in, in, in life during that, those hard times. So um, we all know lots of people who kind of want to live forever but don't have a clue what they could do today that would bring joy into their life or somebody else's life. So you're told, okay, bring joy into your life. Mm -hmm. how, how did you reflect on what brings joy into your life? You really have to step back and look at what makes you happy. And, of course, being successful in work makes you happy. But if you're pushing yourself too far, you know, you need to kind of look at the other parts of life that bring you happiness as and, well. And Andrea, what brings Andrea joy? I love being physically active. So I continue to play volleyball, you know, through the entire thing. I played at Sands Volleyball in the summer. And then even after surgery, I had drains and everything still playing volleyball. You know, my sets aren't quite the same because my mobility of my arm now. Do you hit with your right? Luckily, my strong arm is good. Okay. And it was okay. my left arm that was okay. affected. But So physical activity physical brings you joy. Absolutely. What else brings you joy? Being with friends and family, like mm -hmm. going out to eat. That's I grew up going out to eat, and that's always something we truly enjoy, that mm -hmm. experience. Okay. And, you know, writing also brought me joy. You know, a lot of us don't take the time to think about it. We just, you know, go through every day, taking everything for granted, going through the motions, doing what we mm -hmm. have to do. And writing, I was hoping to be able to help other people through my writing mm -hmm. and talking about my experience. And do you learn about yourself when you write? Yes. Mm -hmm. You learn, you really learn what you are feeling and what you are going through by taking the time to reflect and dig deep. Okay. Do you, did you bring a piece of your writing? I, did, I didn't bring any uh, piece of it. I did bring... Is this... Do a, I have a piece of your writing? I brought a quote as well. Okay. This... You, you've written this, I, right, Yeah, I, I've written a... Yeah. 
a bunch is there, of pieces here. Is there here. A, a paragraph or of some from something that you brought or that I brought that you wrote that you'd like Let's to see. share with us? And and if not, that's okay. Sure. Uh, I'll I'll definitely read a, a piece that I've written. Okay. We are all given this one chance to live. What are you going to do with it? What is your purpose? I've learned that my purpose is to try to make other people happy, whether that is way, by way of delicious food, indulging in conversation, or just being there for someone. Not everyone is given the chance to accept the fact that they might be about to die. And even in facing death, I was motivated to accomplish something or to leave a small mark on this earth before I died. I wanted to create something that would continue my dream of making people happy. I wanted a place where people can come together to enjoy food, atmosphere, and most importantly, to enjoy their loved ones. Whether you have cancer or not, and if you don't have the hope to live and the motivation to succeed, then what else do you have? Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Um, how do you think your cancer journey has changed your life? What, what did it teach you that you didn't already know? Or did it just reinforce things you already knew? Yeah, looking back, it, it seemed like I had a foundation built with all of these tools that I would need to be able to go through what I did from, you know, trying to get good grades and trying to excel at academics and sports and pursuing dreams that seem unrealistic and building that the character and the confidence and the strength even looking back now it's hard to believe that i was strong enough to push my body and my mind to these levels that you would never imagine possible and i still am surprised at, at myself what i was able to do with mm -hmm. that strength and the courage and becoming brave to sign up for drugs and trials that n many other people have never tried before. So I've got a thought and tell me how, if this sounds real. I don't think cancer gave you strength. I think you had that strength there, but cancer allowed you to find that strength and sort of hone it. Yeah. I mean, anybody who's going to drive to California and <laughs> become an actress and go to an audition. I mean, there's a lot of strength there. And uh, just in and, and, and what you went through and then to go from, I'm going to be an actress to we're going to have a food truck and then a restaurant. There's a lot of physical work that goes into that. Those aren't all, all just glamorous. Um, um, so you clearly have tons of strength. And I, I kind of, my theory, but... It, you're, you're entitled to your own is that mm -hmm. you have had always have had incredible strength and that the cancer journey allowed you to find it and going through that difficulty with the support and coming out the end has given you this resiliency yeah. uh, which is basically the knowledge that you've got this strength that that you can rely on when another bump comes in your road right like running a restaurant during COVID, yeah. I, was, <laughs> I was like, here's another challenge that I'm ready to take on, you know. How often do you get scans now? So I am still every six months. Uh huh. And do you have scanxiety? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if I have night sweats, I immediately think, well, there's a chance the cancer is back. Or like if I start losing weight, I like to think that's from, you know, my diet and exercise. But there's part of me that's like, it could be from the cancer because those were like the first two major signs that mm -hmm. made me aware that cancer was present. And um, how much time and effort uh, goes into worrying about will it come back? Is it just something you think about the week of the scan or is it something that is kind of always there or? That's a great question. I feel like cancer is almost part of my everyday life now, which I've accepted it. And I am just super grateful that I'm still here, but each day is different. You know, whether 
this skin, skin anxiety or anxiety in general may just pop up and it's being able to, you know, take that and work with it and work through it. Mm -hmm. Really? Do you think you develop some coping mechanisms with the, the time you spent with mental health counseling during your cancer, the support group that there's some techniques you learned that, that you can rely on now? Yes. A lot of, you know, you need to take a step back. Like if you feel that it's not going well and that you are having a hard time manning, managing that and um, definitely talking to people, writing, um, even like uh, painting, coloring, finding something where you can escape for a moment. Mm -hmm. I also like video games as well. Things like that that can soothe you and bring you back mm -hmm. to being able to manage it. Sort of let your mind focus on something else so intently that mm -hmm. you let go of that. So focusing on something intently, some people would call that mindfulness. Some people might even call it meditation. Yes. To what extent uh, did you learn or do you practice mindfulness techniques? And, and certainly coloring or art mm -hmm. or even a video game can be a, a form of mindfulness if you're totally focused on something. Yes. I think we, everybody should probably take more time than we do to meditate or be mindful and grateful. Uh, I do have a video game that is meditation and it's virtual reality. And so it's this an added element of, you know, breathing techniques. And, you know, uh, I did uh, the audio meditation as well, or even like the going to sleep one. Sometimes if you're having trouble sleeping, just turning on those videos that can help you relax your mind and focus on being present. Mm -hmm. Sort of talk you through a mindfulness yes. practice mm -hmm. that can help. And it can be hard too, because my brain is thinking about 10 different things and what I need to get done and what I should be doing, but it's nice to, and healthy to take that time to be mindful and present and relax your body and mind. Uh, what are your goals in life right now? My goals are constantly changing mm -hmm. and evolving. The last one was making sure the restaurant made it through COVID. And it's always trying to be healthier personally and, you know, getting enough sleep and eating right and doing all of those things. My next goal in life would, I would love to be a mother but that's still something that is unsure at the moment, given my history. Mm -hmm. So um, you bring up an issue that's really important for many people, but especially for uh, what we call young um, or adolescents, um, the AYA, adolescent young adults. So treatment can often affect fertility. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know as much about the immunotherapy effect as we do some of the chemotherapy effects. Um, so that uh, is something that you're... I mean, I'm going to get into asking, do you, do you get all the support you needed or were there some aspects of your health or your overall um, physical, mental, spiritual well-being that wasn't tended to as well as it could have been by, uh, by organized medicine. And I know you've got wonderful doctors and mm -hmm. even the best doctors and the best centers probably don't do everything that, uh, that every patient needs. Were there any... Um, omissions, anything you wished you had had as either support or guidance or information as you were going through? I definitely think I, I wish I would have had more like the physical support. I did do the turkey trot my first Thanksgiving with cancer. And like, that was something that I felt I almost wish I wanted more of. That was right mm -hmm. when I learned what above and beyond cancer was, almost more something more physical. I also did the aquatic program too, but I would have loved to have even more. And 
yes, I guess another way to get more involved in that I should have mm -hmm. like come to more programs right. and push myself further because you've already described that that brings joy yes physical activity sort of the old-fashioned ways oh you got cancer I'm so sorry take naps eat bonbons right don't don't use any energy you shouldn't use and and we now know that engaging in vigorous physical activity while you're going through treatment can actually be helpful mm -hmm. especially if you already know that that is one of the things that stimulates joy in right you. and even like more healthy eating options you know I became vegan to try to help my body in any way that I could and it's very hard to you know find healthy food you know vegan choices yeah. I mean in some medical waiting rooms even have pop machines yeah. and you can buy Doritos the and... hospital yeah <laughs> even like, the food okay like, where's mm -hmm. the disc you know the hour is nearly gone and we've got a large studio audience here. So I'm going to open up for some questions because I've got a dozen more questions, but let's, let's open up for our live studio audience questions for Andrea. Well, you, you said you opened up a restaurant. What is the restaurant name? It's called Gastro Grub and Pub and it's okay. just down Hickman here in Waukee. Yeah, and what's yeah. your, what's, what's Gastro uh, Grub and Pub? What's its claim to fame? We, the signature dish. Yeah, we have a few that we started with the food truck. We have an award-winning buttermilk fried chicken sandwich and a short rib grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, um, I we love do have short ribs. healthy options too. We have vegan options here. A lot of people don't. We have the vegan jackfruit tacos. We have vegan uh, veggie tacos. We have vegan burger. So we try to have you know, the best of both worlds. Like mm -hmm. I like to have, you know, um, some comfort food some days and then, you know, lots of tasty salads as well the other days. And you describe the ambience you're trying to create. Yeah. In, fact, in fact, the way you were describing sound like cheers except yeah. for food. Yes. <laughs> yeah. we like wanna... You're greeting mm -hmm. the folks at the door. Yes. Very warm, uh -huh. cozy. Yeah. It's not a sports bar. You know, we really don't want any screens we want to encourage focusing on the people that you're with okay other questions yes george i just wondered did you lose your athletic stamina and did it come back and how quickly so the question was did you lose your athletic stamina and if you did did it come back and how quickly i did lose a lot of it because i didn't exercise as much as i should have and you know, I would play volleyball when I could and do the things that I enjoyed, but not as much as I really should have. And I still, like with after surgery and radiation, I lost um, mobility in the shoulder. And so I did a lot of physical therapy trying to get that back. I feel like I'm not going to be able to get that full motion back no matter how much I do. And like, I'm not great about exercising in general because running around a restaurant i get my steps in yeah. but it's yeah. not quite mm -hmm. the same and you have a brother that's a physical therapist yes yeah, so okay. i was spoiled i had you know personal physical therapy okay yeah um great other questions yes Boone. What, app do you use for sleep? what app do you use for sleeping or for meditation to help with with meditation or sleeping the app is called calm and then I also use YouTube okay. as well. Great. Well, Andrea, this has been wonderful. You are an inspiration. And um, I, you're already doing this, but I just want to tell you, I, I just so commend you for uh, taking the wisdom that you've gained from your journey to help not just illuminate your own pathway, but to help others along the way. Um, and, I, and we talked a little bit before we started this conversation. I think you would be a really powerful speaker as we advocate for health care reform in, in, and good public policy about tanning beds. To uh, It's really 
quite unfortunate that, you know, the tanning bed industry really preys on young women under the age of 18. And uh, those are probably the most vulnerable in the consequences. So uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to talk you into joining us when we go up to uh, lobby days to advocate for public health policy. For sure. I'd be glad to. Any final words for our audience? Thank you so much for having me. And I hope that my story is able to help anyone and everyone. And I'd be glad to talk to anyone struggling if they ever need a lending ear. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm Dick Deming, and uh, this has been the Cancer Education Series. It is sponsored by the Mercy One Cancer Center and Above and Beyond Cancer. And if you want to watch this again, or if you have uh, folks that you think would uh, enjoy this, you can go to the Mercy One Cancer Center website, where it will be housed and you can watch it there, or you can go to the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel and uh, watch it again. Please come and join us again next week. Thanks for being with us and thanks so much, Andrea. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> what a beautiful job you did. <laughs>